Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. And if you're in a neighborhood, love to join us here at the church. We're open at 8.30. More than welcome to join us here physically before you go to school, go to work, whatever it is that you're, you're doing. Just get some time in with the Lord and also some prayer. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are in the book of Colossians and we'll be looking at chapter 3. Good morning, Patty. Glad you could join us today. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into God's word. Precious Father, we come before you, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. And it's in his name that we ask that you would open up our hearts and our understanding and impart to us wisdom of your word, Lord, and encourage us before we're off today and begin to toil and work for your kingdom and for our families, Father. We need you, Lord, in our lives, and we need to put our faith and focus on you today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's look at Colossians chapter 3. We got a few verses here. The first four verses, we could actually spend quite a bit of time on, right? It's our position as believers in Christ Jesus, who we are in Christ, which is important. We all have an, an identity, right? People are really big on that. What's your identity? What's your call? What's your purpose in life? You'll hear those, those kind of words. Uh, what is your reason for existing here? You know, and some will say a doctor, to please myself, to travel the world, you know, to learn, to grow, to get wiser, to raise children. I mean, there's all kinds of purposes. Um, but here's what the Bible tells us our place and purposes in life. Paul says, if then you were raised with Christ, in other words, when you were born again, became a believer in Christ and put your life in his hands and surrendered to his will, he said, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. So what is our purpose? To seek those things which are above. Now, what does he mean by that? Look up in the sky and see what God has for us? No. <laughs> Seek out the purpose of God. Seek out his wisdom, his direction, his calling. And he's called us all. And he's given us all various gifts and purposes that we should use for his glory. Uh, you've probably heard this phrase many times. You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. How many have heard that phrase before, right? Yeah. And, and what someone is saying when they tell you that is that you're not a help to me at all because you're so way up here in the heavens that you can't help me here on this earth. Uh, oftentimes, there is some truth to that. And oftentimes when someone comes to help, the, the only help that we give them is, I'll pray for you, brother and sister. You know, Let me just pray for you. And I get that. Sometimes there's really nothing that you can do but allow them to go through what they're going through and be there for them in prayer, definitely. But I like what John Corson said, that unless we are heavenly minded, we cannot be any earthly good. So we have to be heavenly minded. We have to think about the heavens. We have to look up uh, where God is at to find wisdom, to find understanding, to find direction. Uh, we seek out the wisdom of God, the instructions of God, so that we can be effective here on this earth. So that is our call. That is our purpose. Every man, every woman, every child should be seeking those things which are above. How we ought to live our lives on this earth. How we treat one another. How we handle relationships. How we handle those who are strangers. How we come into new opportunities. All these things should be sought from above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. He says, set your mind on these things, set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. If they were set on the mind, if they were set on the things of the earth, it would be idolatry. So hold on to things lightly on this earth. We don't have them forever. Here's a good question to ask. If God asked you to get rid of your house and all your things, would you do it? Would you do it? Because there's a lot of people that would say, no, that's my house. That's where my kids grew up. That's where we lived. That was the first purchase in our lives. But if God said, get rid of it all and move to one apartment room, would you do it? Or are you holding on to that so dearly? 
Are you holding on to that antique car that's sitting in your garage doing nothing? You know, are you holding on to that dearly? If the Lord said, sell that and give it to the missions, would you sell it and give it to the missions? You know, that's where you realize how strongly we're holding on to things. Mm. Um, so that's why you set your mind on the things above and not on the things of this earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear in him. So everything is heavenly bound, right? Everything is heavenly bound. We're only here for a season, for a small time compared to eternity. If you were to take the string from beginning to end, which is eternity, that's pretty long. And yet we're just a strand, a little speck. If you take a marker and just put a dot in one of that little strand, that's nothing compared to eternity. So we're all heavenly bound. Our purpose should be heavenly bound. Our lives on this earth should be thinking of heavenly bound. It's not about this earth and what we can do and enjoy upon this earth. And so many think it is. And that is why I think that we need to be busy about the Lord's kingdom. <clears throat> so much is happening in our world today that we don't even realize. It's interesting that yesterday I heard Trump's speech on uh, Twitter or Facebook, where, where he told people that are um, upset with our country and the way our country is being run, that he basically said, look, if you don't like our country, you can leave. That's the freedom we have, right? We can just leave. You, you can leave this country and go to another country, and, and if you find things that are bad there, fix them if you can, and then come back. But don't come to this country and hate it, because this is a great country. That's what he's saying. So now... All the, the, the hoopla is he's a racist because he's asking all women, uh, African-American and Muslim, to leave this country. And he never said that. I listened to the, to the video. He never said that. And they're twisting his words. He actually called us out, and he, th these women all stood up who were in office, and he called us out. He wants us to leave because he's a racist person. But he never said any names. He never said any names at all. You know, our country is headed in a bad direction. And unfortunately, and I'm going to just say the truth, the Democrats are raising an army to be violent against anybody that's against their view. Mm. Very simple and clear. <clears throat> Very simple and clear. When you have people in office saying that they're physically going to attack someone, there's another person <clears throat> that was of the gay agenda that attacked a, a, public, uh, a public official and said, I, if I see you on the streets, I will kill you, I will murder you, I will shoot you. Wow. It just plain out attack slanderous. They brought it to the to California's liberal judicial system, and they said, "Oh no, there's there's no uh, 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 what do they call it uh, hate crime there at all." And they didn't want to even prosecute it. Why? Because it was towards a Demo uh, a Republican who was very conservative. Wow, when that bad. happens, and our judicial system is breaking down like that, we're in big trouble, guys. Yeah. We're in big trouble. This is what's happening because men's eyes are on this world and not on heaven at all. So what do we do? We need to put on the new Christ. Look at verse 5. Therefore, put to death old members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you also once walked when you lived among them. Be very clear what Paul just said there. He's telling the church here in Colossians, you need to get rid of these things in your life. Anything that's, a, that's fornication, that means sex outside of marriage, anything that's unclean, anything that, that has passions of evil desires, anything that's covetousness, because God's wrath is coming on those things. It, it surprises me when people support the gay agenda right, the gay, lesbians, blah, 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 or when they support uh, the Democrats who are inciting violence against others. It, it, it's crazy because God says his wrath is coming on them. And instead of us fighting with them, we should be correcting them and helping them see that what's happening is you're bringing wrath and the wrath of God is going to come upon you if you don't change your lives. But we don't love them enough to do so. We think that tolerance and acceptance and saying it's okay to live that way is what God wants when it's not. He's saying, my wrath is coming upon them. And unless they repent and turn from their wicked ways, 
uh, ha they have no hope. That's what he's saying here. All these things are going to come on the sons of, he says, the sons of disobedience. But he said, you Colossians used to walk that way and you no longer walk that way. So keep it that way. He goes on, but now you must also put off all things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth, filthy language. So the cussing and swearing shouldn't be coming out of Christians' mouths. And Christians think that we can cuss. We can use swear words. We can use innuendos. I cringe when people uh, use words <clears throat> like that. <clears throat> Good Christians, ladies too. And they use little, little picture words that you go, ooh, couldn't you find something else to, to say besides that little picture? Because I got this picture in my head now and I don't like that. You know, and what else could I say? I mean, that explains it very clearly. Yeah, it explains it very clearly. It surely does, but it's not how God wants us to speak or talk. Filthy language should not be coming out of our mouths. We should speak edification. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who has created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, uh, Cyanian, slave or free, but Christ in all and in all. Uh, don't lie to one another. God, that's a big one. We lie so much to one another. It's crazy how much we lie to one another. <clears throat> You're in ministry and, you know, you get confronted with an issue and instead of just being honest, there's all these excuses, rationalizations and all of these things. Um, look, we need to stop that stuff. We're all sinners, we all fall short, we've all messed up. So, hey, if I drop the ball, I've dropped the ball. You know, forgive me. I'm gonna try not to drop the ball next time, you know? Uh, people have left with lies. Oh, we're leaving because we just love everyone here and we got somewhere else to go. Stop lying. Why are you really leaving? What is the real purpose, you know? Um, but we do it all the time. It's in our nature to be liars. Um, that's what the Bible says. Thou shalt not lie, and yet we lie. The very fiber of our being is corrupt. And if we have a tendency, it's always a tendency to do wrong and speak lies. Uh, thank God that he has saved us. And Paul is saying here, look, don't do that. Be honest people, be sincere. Uh, we all mess up. We all, you know, don't keep the scriptures as we should. And we need help and encouragement. He goes on, says, put on the new man then. That's the old man. We're to put him off. So let's put on the new man. This is what we should be doing as believers. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy, beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. And above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing uh, with grace in your hearts uh, to the Lord. Uh, admonishing, teaching. It's, it's what happens here at the church. We admonish, we teach through the Bible. We teach through the scriptures. And when the scriptures talk on a specific subject, we talk about that specific subject. Some people don't like that because they don't want to hear the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. Um, but the Bible is true. And it's our instruction, it's our correction. And we should be teaching one another these things. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is, imp this is an important verse here. Because he says it very clear. In, in whatever you do, whatever it is that you're doing, do whether it's in word, and if you're giving your words, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this. Or if it's deed and you're literally doing it all, you know, and you're taking care of this and you're taking care of that. Whatever it is, do it in whose name? God's name. God's name. You're not serving anybody on earth. You're serving who? God. God. And so if you're serving God, how well do you, of a job do you want to do? 
You want to do a good job because you're serving God himself, the creator of heaven and earth. Now, we're all different and we do things differently. The model of, of how we do things can change by persons because persons do things differently. Uh, Yvonne is in charge of Calvary Cares. You know, when I was in charge of Calvary Cares, and not Calvary Cares at the time, but I can't remember what it was called back then, Feeding the Sheep, I believe it was called. You know, I did things a certain way. She does things differently. And so I don't mind that because it's no longer my ministry. It's hers. Whatever she does in word and in deed, it's, it's what she does for God, not for me. She's doing it for God, not for me. So she's serving God. And I love that because <clears throat> she's going to do a better job for God than she does for me. Amen. And she's not going to compare and say, well, Reuben, you do it this way, but I don't like that. And it doesn't matter <clears throat> how I did it. It doesn't matter how I do it because you're serving God and not me. So don't use the excuse that we're different in the way we do things. Yeah, we are, but God has entrusted you to do it. So do it for his glory. <clears throat> and don't complain and murmur because other people aren't doing it. God gave it to you to do. He gave it to you to do. That's why he put you in that place, in that position, in that ministry, for you to do that. And he's asking you to do it for who? For the Lord. That is so easy, but yet so difficult for us to do, that we do everything for the Lord. We raise our kids for the Lord, not for us. They're not, we want you well-behaved because it reflects who we are and, you know, when they see you. No, we want you well-behaved because it reflects God. It reflects God, not our parents. So when you raise your children, your grandchildren, and who you're investing in and your family, you're doing it for the Lord, for his kingdom. And you do it according to his teachings and the scripture. So whatever you put your hands to, when you work, you're not, you're not working for your boss. You're not working for your paycheck. And I know I hear that. I work for a paycheck every week. Yeah, we get paid, but we work for who? The yeah. Lord. We work for the Lord. Everything is for the Lord. Mm -hmm. If you see a piece of paper on the ground in the church grounds, pick it up. Why? Because it's for the Lord. It's not for someone else. God showed it to you. You saw it. Oh, there's a piece of paper. Someone needs to pick that up. And you walk <laughs> right by it. You know? No, God opened your eyes to see it. If he had not opened your eyes, you would have missed it, never saw it, never would have touched it. But because he opened your eyes, you should pick it up and throw it away because that's what he's expecting you to do. It's almost like God saying, look what's on the ground right there. Would you pick it up? He doesn't have to say that because he just opened your eyes to see it. And that's basically what he's saying. And it's interesting because people will say, come to me and say, hey, we need this ministry. And if we could do this and I'm looking at him like, it sounds like God wants you to do it. Why don't you do that? Oh, no, I don't want to do it. Well, God didn't lay it on my heart. <laughs> he spoke to you about how important that was. And how you should get involved. Because I, I know of people that have been in church and I don't like the way this is done. I don't like this ministry. And they don't have this for the children. And they don't have that for the children. I remember years ago we didn't have a high school uh, ministry. Uh, so um, people would come in and they would ask me, what do you have going on for the high school? And right now we don't have anything. Oh, we need our kids involved in high school. We want to place to drop them off on, their, on Fridays. And, and I would say, okay, great, that's wonderful. I, I'm glad you have a vision for all of that. Why don't you start on Friday and helping out? Oh, no, we don't want to do it. Oh, okay, gotcha, got you. God opens your eyes on how important it is for a church to have something like that. Uh, he sees it, it's a great outreach. It, it pours into the kids. He's shown you all this wonderful things and, and how you think it's important and how the churches should be doing it, but then you don't want to do it. So obviously you want someone else to do it. See, God opens our eyes to things so that we do it. And we do it for who? For him. He's the one showing us to do these things. But what we do is we just jump from church to church. I don't like this church, so let's go to another church. I don't like the way they don't have this, so let's go to another church. And people go church to church instead of learning where they're at. Whatever you do in word or deed, and that's whatever, Whatever it is, you can be vacuuming. I remember, and I tell you guys this story all the time. I, I, I could remember vacuuming the church, and I'm like, where's everybody? Lord, how come they're not here helping me? <laughs> you're not doing it for me. You're doing it for them, huh? You want them there. So I would start singing songs, and I would vacuum for the Lord and sing to the Lord. And so I'm doing this for you, Lord, and I'm doing the best job that I can for you, God, in your kingdom. And I would do it for him. And that got me out of that mode of thinking of others and how they ought to be doing it. Now, should others be helping? Of course. 
if they're not doing anything, they should be involved in helping out. I remember going up to, um, I think it was Crestline or, or, or um, Bear Valley, which is up in the mountains here, San Bernardino Mountains. And I had a job to do, and it was actually at a Calvary Chapel church. And so I was doing the job, and it was like on a Tuesday morning. And, and all of a sudden, all these cars start pulling in and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just watching them all, and they're all bringing out their little uh, Rubbermaid buckets and stuff like that. And so uh, one guy came over to me and said, what's going on? I told him what I was there for. And I said, what's going on here? He goes, oh, this is all the people from the church. They just come in, and they clean the church on Tuesdays. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. So they, they take ownership. They saw a need, and they all just gathered together, and they came into the church. They vacuumed. They cleaned. They washed everything. you know. And I'm talking about, I would say, a good 15 people. And the place wasn't that big, so it could get done real quick. And they were fellowshipping, fellowshipping at the same time. And who were they doing it for? For the Lord. So whatever you do, whatever deed, whatever you say, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, that scripture is so easy, but it's so difficult to do. We need to do that with a lot of prayer and purposely. So what should we do to, to get this to stick in our head? This is what I would do. I would purposely put myself in a place where I did it. And I would grumble through it and say, I need to do this for you, Lord, so help me to do this for you. Because it's just not about this one thing. It's about anything that I do for you, Lord, that I wouldn't go grumble through it. So when there's a call, hey, could you come out on Saturday? We, we have weeds to pull. Oh, I don't want to go out and pull weeds. I would purposely go out so I can grumble through it and say, Lord, I do this for you and get through that. And then the next time and then the next time. And now whatever you do, you'll find yourself, this is for you, Lord. And you've changed your mindset. They say it takes 21 days to create a habit, three weeks, and create a habit. If you do that for three weeks and do things that you don't want to do, but you grumble through it, and you say, Lord, this is for you, change my heart, change my mind, make me that new person, in three weeks, you'll have a whole new mindset. So then whatever you do, you're going to do it for the Lord, whatever it is that you do. I don't know if that helps you or not, but it helped me. So now here, let's talk about grumbling. Verse 18, <laughs> wives, submit to your own husbands and is fitting in the Lord. That's a tough one to do too. The only way to learn that lesson is for you wives to submit to your husbands. Submit to them. You know, he doesn't give you the details here. He doesn't tell you in what to submit. But I believe that as long as it's scriptural, it's biblical, you should submit. If it is going to bring harm to you, harm to your family, if it's destructive, then obviously you need to, to pray and seek the Lord on whether it's something that you should submit to or not. But I can only say this, what the Bible says. When you go back to the Old Testament, you see, Ab you see um, Sarah submitting to her husband, Abraham, when he said, tell him you're my sister, and she submitted, and then the king takes her as his own wife, you have to say, Abraham, what were you thinking, knucklehead? But see, God protected her because she was obedient to submit to her husband. Well, that's a different culture, different time. That's what they did. Well, God is still the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He has made woman to come alongside the husband to help the husband be what they need to be. And husbands need to step up and be what they need to be and stop letting their wives take their place because there are husbands that do that. I'll just go to my wife. She knows what to do. No, you need to know what to do. You need to change your mind. You need to grow up. You need to start reading books, start getting instructions, start getting busy, start being the aggressive in your family and, and stop allowing your wife to lead you. She needs to submit to you, her husband and that's fitting in the Lord, he says here. And husbands, what's their responsibility? Love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. I don't know why they would be bitter towards them, but I have a feeling that it's because they're not submitting and there's a way of, uh, that kind of gets at a man when they're not being allowed to lead and there's a bitterness there. And so Paul is saying, don't be bitter, just love them, take care of them, cherish them. And when they can't submit, understand that. They're the weaker vessel, uh, but take charge of that responsibility. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is the will, this is well pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, at least they become discouraged. Now, notice how this all follows that whatever you do in word or deed, do all to who? To the Lord. 
to the Lord. So even in your relationships, the wives submitting to their husband, husbands loving their wives, children obeying their parents, you do that all to the Lord. I'm submitting to you, mama and daddy, because I'm doing it unto the Lord. I don't like it because I'm 15 and I know better than you. I've been through life and so <laughs> I know what I'm doing. So I'm, but I'm gonna submit to you anyway. You know, oftentimes I find that the things that we struggle with in this submission and getting our way, that they're not big issues, you know? Uh, we always hear the one about the toilet paper, right? I like the toilet paper roll to go on top. Others like it on the bottom. And we turn that into a big issue when it really doesn't matter. <laughs> so what is the whole battle when two people, adults, are arguing over a piece of toilet paper? And they're grabbing it and holding it and squeezing it and yanking it. Can't you see? It goes like this. And they're throwing paper at each other. Two adults doing that. Now, that's a ridiculous picture to see. But you just go, what is the real issue there? The real issue is pride. It is all pride and wanting to have your own way. That's what it's about. And we need to get rid of that. We need to realize that we do all things unto the Lord. Lord, my wife likes the paper to go on top. I'm doing this to you, God. I'm allowing her to have it go on top to you, Lord, because I love you and you want me to get along and live in peace. So I'm doing this for you, God. I'll tolerate it. So while I'm sitting there, it comes on top. That's fine. It's no big deal. I can learn to fix that. I can learn to live with that paper coming on top. It doesn't make any sense. My hand doesn't roll right on it. You know, who knows? When I got married, uh, my mom used to make bacon. When she made bacon, it, it was never crisp. It was just cooked lightly and it, you could just take it and it was wiggly when you ate it. And that's how I grew up eating breakfast. I remember Virginia making, bre making bre bre uh, bacon. I'm trying to speak fast because I only got one minute. Uh, making bacon and it was crispy, almost burnt. And I'm like, what kind of bacon is this? <laughs> Who makes burnt bacon? This makes no sense, you know? And it, it took me a long time to, to get over bacon not being flexible, you know? But I learned, because that's how she made it, that's how she likes it, that's how she grew up in it. So I had to learn to change mine. Now I like crispy bacon. It's taken a while, but I like crispy bacon. But who cares? You're eating bacon, whether crispy or bad. But we fight over things, why? Because we want the power. We're prideful people. He goes on, and let's end here, 22, 24. Again, we do all things to the Lord. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing who? God. God. Why? Because you're doing it for who? For God, yes. not for them, not for men. And whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly as to the Lord and not to men. He's really emphasizing that, isn't he? Knowing that from the Lord you will what? Receive a reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord. Who do you serve? The, the Lord. Lord. You don't serve me as a pastor. You don't serve the board here. You serve the Lord. But he who does wrong will be repaid for the wrong which he has done. And there is no partiality. You wonder why your marriage isn't working? Maybe because you're trying to serve yourself and not the Lord. Ask that question to yourself. Is it because I'm serving myself in my relationship and not the Lord that we're struggling so much? Are we fighting and battling? Our marriage isn't the greatest marriage. Maybe you need to serve the Lord and serve one another. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your precious word and a reminder, Lord, we're not our own, Father. We really aren't, Lord. We have been bought at a price and the price was your son, Jesus Christ, on a cross so that we could become his slaves and do his bidding at his will. And we choose now as free bond servants to serve the Lord in everything that we do. And we do it unto him purposely and willfully, Lord, because we know that our reward will be eternal life and in heaven. And so, Lord, help us to get that principle in our head as believers, Father. And I think that a lot of issues and problems will disappear in our lives when we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. And I didn't mean to offend or make fun of any of that, um, though I did. <laughs> um, serious stuff there. And I think that we ought to take it seriously. 
that God has called us to serve. And it's not an easy thing to do uh, for people that aren't used to serving others. So God bless you guys. If you have any prayer requests, please uh, post them or private email uh, message me. And we'll pray for you right now as we're going to take time to pray. Have a wonderful day. Mm.